It's been okay, hold on. I know One Week by Bare Naked Ladies is a meme. It's weird, it's loud, it's very 90s, it makes no sense, and it's a fun punchline to use whenever mention of a 7 day time frame is appropriate. But like, let's be serious for a second, and remind ourselves that it's also a legitimately good song. It's catchy as hell, it's unique, it's fun, it's self-aware, it's on the Digimon the Movie soundtrack. Those are practically the five holy pillars of songwriting carved into stone through music history. And One Week has it all. But because of that other stuff, it's just that one stupid silly song. And that's kind of a microcosm of the Bare Naked Ladies as a whole, often being seen as just that one stupid silly band. When in reality, yeah, One Week is a good song. But the Bare Naked Ladies are actually a great band. One that's much more than that. Now, if you're in Canada, you were probably already taught this in school. They've always gotten heavy praise in their home turf and have had solid staying power there, but outside of that brief moment in 1998, that wasn't matched elsewhere. They were never a big winner with music critics. Their biggest hit was a nonsensical song with a dweeby white guy rapping, and even their band name is entirely a joke, if you couldn't tell already. And related to that, they even insisted on advertising that they recorded one song on each album with the band completely naked. It's easy to view them as just a novelty act, so any sort of legacy that they have outside of Canada doesn't feel like a strong one, or even that close to comparable acts like they might be giants when it comes to how respected they are. But try as they might, it doesn't change the fact that they truly are a multi-talented band who has made more great songs than I can count. And so I'm here to demand that you take them seriously. Because when you really look at it all, the distinct vocals of each member, Jim Cregan's upright bass being unique for a pop rock band, their clever songwriting, Ed Robertson's effortless charm, I mean few people could have actually pulled off that rap the way he did, and Stephen Page's passionate, boisterous role as the frontman, they're all used so effectively with any of the faces that the band can place on themselves. That's all there on one week. But to show the opposite end of what they can do, go to their very first album, Gordon, which arguably has the most tonal range of their entire discography. 14 sprawling tracks that can touch on their shameless humor and songs like Grade 9. They call me Fatso! They call me Buckwheat! They called me Eddie. Be my Yoko Ono. Yoko sings my <laughs> Or If I Had a Million Dollars. If I had a million dollars, we wouldn't have to be crafted, but we would. But the record also reaches its peaks with a multitude of successfully intimate moments. Blame It On Me is a smooth, chilling track displaying the frustrated dialogue in a fractured relationship. What a Good Boy is a passionate ballad that touches on gender norms and is certainly one of Paige's most touching vocal performances. Most notably, though, is the song Brian Wilson. Being among the band's most popular tracks, Brian Wilson is this expansive, ambitious, yet still catchy and intimate song that has Paige narrating his almost obsessive music listening and record bin scrounging, possibly just to keep his mind occupied while battling a depression of some sort. And through these anxieties, he's finding multiple connection points between himself and Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Firstly, obviously, just from listening to his records, but also his depression keeping him in his room being very similar to periods of Brian's life a dream where he becomes more and more obese, again lining up with Brian's weight gain when under the care of Eugene Landy, and even outside of what's in the text, Paige possibly related to him further through his then undiagnosed bipolar disorder. The instrumentals manage to match this depressive state while also surging forward. It has a lot more low, downer tones in it, with the drum fills being more focused on the booming toms and the snare, and the bass being pushed closer to the front of the mix than usual. It even includes a rare bass solo at the end. They're married particularly well to the lyrics in the bridge, when Paige is illustrating that dream of him gaining weight. As the song strips down to just the acoustic guitar, he says he weighed 300 pounds, he suddenly started floating, and the next thing he knew, he was so high he couldn't see the ground. Following that, the full band returns at their usual pace, while Paige repeats that last idea. I couldn't see the ground. I couldn't see the ground. The band maintains their speed while building ever so slightly in volume and intensity, mimicking the consistency in how Paige is being pulled away and how his hopelessness is unchained, but also the building anxiety of the situation. Such a well-layered song, both metaphorically, but also literally, given the outro jam does reach a near wall of sound level. Really, is possibly the band's actual definitive musical statement, an argument as to why to take Bare Naked Ladies seriously could begin and end with Brian Wilson and still be plenty convincing. But I think there's other stuff to get into. Because beyond that, I would also further stress that Bare Naked Ladies' sound isn't necessarily them jumping back and forth between the side that's full-on jokes and the side that's more vulnerable and straight-faced. A lot of their songs rest in the land between them, and it's worth pointing out that their willingness to be silly and insert punchlines or black humor into their music is often used in legitimately clever ways. 
sometimes even in songs that largely fall into the more serious side of their sound. It isn't just, oh, look at us, unlike most bands, we're silly. For example, on their album Maroon, there's a subdued, low-key track called Conventioneers, about two work colleagues trying to manage their attraction to each other. Early in the song, Paige sings, And we laugh, and we laugh, and we have to or we'll end up in the bath. Following a short pause, the first line of the next verse is then, Now we're in the bath. It's a punchline, with him immediately contradicting himself. He uses the divide between verses like how you could with a jump cut in a movie. And you don't hear that often in songs. These little lyrical rug pulls work well with their black humor, too, especially on that record. Pinch Me's opening lines, It's the perfect time of year, somewhere far away from here, or Never Do Anything with Could you pass the song? Their macro songwriting is strong enough. Songs are generally cohesive and effective thematically like the aforementioned Brian Wilson, plus many others like The Old Apartment, When I Fall, etc, etc. And they tend to tell stories of these endearingly small lives. The perspective of a window cleaner, a farmer, or an office worker. But the real highlight for them is the micro songwriting. These smaller strings of lines that they absolutely nail, whether it's through humor, or poignance, or just some sort of double meaning that's too clever to not appreciate. Like, they add to the songs they're in, but you can remove them from the context, look at the line isolated, and still think, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty neat, I like that. One of my favorite instances is an Ed Robertson track that has a chorus with the line, why aren't we making the love we're in? Which I've always thought was absolutely brilliant. I, I don't have a ton to say about it or to tie it into other stuff, but I, it's, it's so simple, it's so clever, and saying a lot with a little. And that's from one of the least listened to songs on an often ignored album of theirs. Or another one I love is the closer to Maroon, Tonight is the Night I Fell Asleep at the Wheel, which is about a guy driving home to where his wife is, but dying in a car crash on the way there. It's essentially bookended with the line, you're the last thing on my mind, being said at the beginning and end of the song, but having completely opposite meanings in each moment. Initially it's that his wife couldn't be further from his mind, he isn't thinking about her at all, he's just driving home because it's the usual part of his day. But at the end, following the car wreck, it's very literal. His last thoughts before death were of her. And I just think that's neat. I'll cut myself off here so that for the whole video, I'm not just incessantly pointing at random lyrics and saying like, ooh, that one's cool, and that one, look, look, look. But yeah, they're pretty cool. But predominantly talking about the lyrics would undercut the strength of the band's general musicality. The core of their sound is this comforting, often acoustic pop rock that goes down easy. But with four songwriters who can all create on their own or collaboratively, even though two of those members handle the majority of the songs, it isn't shocking that they can cover a wide variety of sounds. I mean, Kevin Hearn practically seems like he can play any instrument on the planet, so may as well make use of that. The 2003 album, Everything to Everyone, while a bit uneven as a record, showcases that well. Plenty of songs from the usual pop rock area, but they also touch on country sounds, vaguely synthesized electronic elements on one song, a folk ballad, and a track largely driven by strings and an accordion. Two of those actually work especially well, and what bridges together any amount of styles they try is the band's consistent talent as vocalists. Stephen Page of course stands out the most with his wide range and very punchy, expressive vocal style that's filled to the brim with personality. The way he sings, it's like, even on studio recordings, you can practically hear him jumping all over the stage, throwing his arms around, his eyes widening. He manages to always feel like not just the band's lead singer, but their frontman. Ed's very strong in his own right, as he handles lead a good amount of the time too, his style is a bit more sensitive, and the occasional Jim Cregan or Kevin Hearn tracks are always welcome. But their strongest moments are actually the backing vocals and harmonies. Their voices all match together so well to fill out and lift up every song with perfect pitch, whether it's placed in gentle ballads, whether used in more upbeat woohoos, whether it's Steve and Ed matching together so well, or the whole band being in sync. If there's any aspect to songs that the band never fails with, it's those. Vocal harmonies like what they have make good songs great and great songs amazing. And for the last point with regards to their songwriting, the most crucial part of their recipe was the partnership between Ed and Steve. They co-wrote a majority of what's on the band's first eight records, with Ed's strengths leaning more instrumental and Steve's lyrical, and the partnership I'd imagine also feeding into the famous lighthearted aspects of the band, as they were probably trying to entertain each other just as much as they were any potential listeners. 
and the performances of the songs often showcase that partnership in a way. Like a common structure on their debut album was to have Steve sing lead on the verse and chorus, and Ed comes in to lead the bridge. Or sometimes they'll trade lines, trade verses, or do whatever the hell they're doing on one week. And trying to accomplish that in different ways probably is part of what opens up their general songwriting to use less common structures, like not having a chorus, having the bridge reappear several times, or even that really weird spot at the end of Enid where Steve is singing lines to the rhythm of the chorus while Ed is singing completely different lines to the rhythm of the bridge. The Steve and Ed partnership is the literal origin of the band, but also the starting point of almost everything that made them great. The vocal harmonies, the song structures, the endless charm and personality. It inevitably means that there's often a missing piece in any of the albums that followed Steve's departure from the band in 2009. And that's okay, it's just how it goes with any number of songwriting partners that split. Now, if I were to recommend a particular album that presents that pair and everything else discussed here at its best, That'd actually be tough, because one other thing that held back the popular perception of the band is that they don't really have a perfect studio record. A singular definitive studio album that stands on its own is excellent, you can easily point to it as a clear representation of the band's strengths. Like, Maroon is solidly great, Gordon's close behind it, and they have other good albums, but they're usually either missing some unquantifiable piece needed to boost it up that extra notch, or more often actually needed to be trimmed down a little. Because the band definitely does have a case of Red Hot Chili Peppers Syndrome where it's like, man, do you really need that many songs on the album? I mean, come on, just like take a few songs off this, off of that, and they go from good to great. It's so simple, yet you manage to not do it. Most albums should be 10 or 11 songs, but they're like 14, take it or leave it. So honestly, if I had to convert someone into a fan with just one album, I'd probably have to pick their first live album, Rock Spectacle, that they did after their first three records. And I don't often pick a live album to start with, but this is one of the exceptions because it's actually one of their tighter releases given it has just 11 tracks. Beyond that, Paige's voice is a little unchained outside of the studio, which is to its benefit. You say you love me, is that the truth? You say you love me, is that the truth? Although they've heard the songs my friends need Although they've heard the songs, my friends need living proof. I know your address. Burn the bell. Turns a few tracks that didn't make a big impact on their original release into true standouts, arguably even improves on tracks that were already fan favorites. The guitar and piano ring out well, the crowd's positive energy is great, and this also shows the band's strong improvisation, natural humor, and stage presence. It really can't be understated just how perfect the live setting is for the band. Obviously, with any of the videos I've done, I've had to search through and use plenty of clips on whatever artist I'm talking about performing live. But with the Bare Naked Ladies, I easily got sucked into just watching and enjoying the performances instead of immediately dropping them into Premiere Pro way more often than I did with any other act I made a video on. They're so expressive and fun and often put in these little ad-lib sections between songs or even within songs, but legitimately also their performances can manage to sound impressively accurate to how the songs were on their original albums, not being neutered at all from being outside the studio. In fact, if there's a notable difference, as mentioned earlier, it's usually an improvement. And what Rock Spectacle has to top it all off is a track list that, while not quite my 11 favorite songs from that era of the band, I feel no desire at all to change. Brian Wilson and What a Good Boy, as mentioned before, showcase their earnestness well. Break Your Heart has its unique chorusless song structure. Hello City has some of their clever, cynical humor paired with Paige's vocal charisma. Jane and When I Fall have especially lovely harmonies, the latter of which, along with These Apples, are Ed Robertson tracks that offers a change of pace from the Page songs, and they close with If I Had a Million Dollars, which has the lighthearted mood that the band is most famous for, as well as a crucial pair of Steve and Ed singing as a duet. There's so many different faces they switch between and juggle so well, none of which even sound remotely like One Week, which is strong in its own right too. They're too multi-talented of a band to be defined by a single song. When you really sit down and hear them, that stupid silly band is just stupid good at what they do. 